All right, book of Judges, chapter number 13. Judges, chapter number 13. Lesson number 6, Old Testament survey 3. Judges, chapter number 13. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this evening. God, would you please help us in the time we have remaining to learn these lessons, and learn them well, apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Judges chapter number 13. This chapter begins the story of Samson, the next judge to the nation of Israel, Samson. Very, very famous story, very, very educational story. Samson contains the most chapters of any of the judges uh, on his <laughs> ministry, if you want to call it that. Uh, many, many, or more, more chapters are dedicated to Samson than any of the other judges. As famous as this story is, it is not necessarily a happy story. Sam, the, the, the theme of the, of the story of Samson, if you wanted to summarize it, it's a story of wasted potential. Story of wasted potential. The few successes recorded in Samson's life just make us wonder what it could have been like if he had fully followed the Lord. There's a few things that Samson does <clears throat> during his life that could be defined as a success, but the majority of life is just a, an absolute flop, an absolute failure. And it really makes us look at Samson's life and say, what could this man have done? If he did this much for the Lord and he was a carnal wreck, what could have Samson have done with his life if he would have chose to fully live for the Lord? If he would have chose to follow the Lord, like he was supposed to follow the Lord, and we're just left to wonder because he didn't. He was a, a carnal wipeout. The chapter opens with a familiar statement. <clears throat> the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. This time they're serving the Philistines, and they do so for 40 years. Uh, Joshua 13 is not going to do much for us. That was last semester. Here we go. Judges 13. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. In verses 2 through 5, we're going to go through this chapter quickly, spend some time in the next chapter. Verses 2 through 5, the angel of the Lord appears to Samuel's mother and tells her that she was going to conceive and bear a son. This was a very big deal for this woman because the Bible says she was barren, meaning that she was unable to have children. Verse number 2 tells us uh, there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. There are multiple women in the Bible who were barren, but who were made to have child by the Lord. Number one, Sarah. Genesis 16.1, the Bible says that Sarah was barren. Genesis 16.1, Rebecca was barren. Genesis 25.21, but the Lord opened her womb. Number three, obviously here, Manoah's wife. It's Judges chapter 13. Hannah, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, was barren, could not have a child. That's the story of her going to the temple and begging the Lord, praying to the Lord, and the Lord giving her Samuel. Number five, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was barren. Her and her husband could not have a child, but then the Lord uh, opened her womb. Psalm 113 verse 9 says, He maketh the barren women to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. In these verses, Elizabeth is strictly warned. I said Elizabeth. Uh, in, sorry, not Elizabeth. The, the, her name's not given. This woman is strictly warned by the angel to keep herself from wine, strong drink, or any unclean thing because the child was to be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. Look at verse number four. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So this angel comes to this woman and says, you're going to have a son, but I'm warning you right now, before you have that son, while you are pregnant with that child, you are not to eat anything from the vine. You're not to drink strong drink. You're not to drink wine. 
Because that child, when that child is born, is going to be a Nazarite unto the Lord. And once he's born, you're not supposed to cut his hair. You're not supposed to shave his head. Let that hair grow because he's going to fulfill the Nazarite vow. Let's talk about that vow for a minute. This is something we talked about just last semester, but I'm going to refresh your memory by going over a few things quickly pertaining to the Nazarites. We're literally going to go over the same material we went over last semester. This is not going to be needful for your test, so you can ignore this test-wise, but you got to know this, uh, at least be refreshed on this in order to understand this story. The main chapter concerning Nazarites is found in Numbers chapter number 6. Numbers chapter number 6 contains the rules and instructions pertaining to the vow of a Nazarite. The Nazarite vow was a voluntary agreement that a man or woman could enter into before God. If a person chose voluntarily of their own free will to enter into this agreement, they were bound to follow a stringent set of rules that were specific to the Nazarites. These rules went above and beyond the required conduct of a normal Jewish man or woman and included, number one, no eating or drinking anything that came from a grape or vine tree. No eating or drinking anything that came from a grape or vine tree. Number two, no razor was to come upon his head. No razor was to come upon his head. And number three, he was not to come into contact with a dead body. So the Lord intended for Samson, and I'm going to warn you right now, every time I go to say Samson, I want to say Solomon or Samuel. So those are going to come out a lot too. I just, I mean Samson, and unless it's obvious that I mean otherwise. The Lord desired for Samson to live a Nazarite vow from the time he was born. Here's a few important considerations concerning the Nazarite vow. One, it was voluntary. Almost always. <laughs> voluntary. Number two, it was to the Lord. Number three, there was no specific time period that the Nazarite vow was to be uh, adhered to. It was up to the individual. Number four, the rules forbade that which was otherwise acceptable. Okay, they couldn't eat grapes. Most people can eat grapes. It's not a sin to eat grapes, but for that Nazarite, he was not supposed to eat grapes. Number five, in that number six passage, we see that separation did not equal isolation. They were still to have contact with people. It wasn't a, a sort of monk situation. Okay, Samson is the only Nazarite specifically mentioned in the Bible. But this is important. And now exit, exit, non-test material. Enter back into fair game. It's important to remember that Samson was an unusual and special case. We just told you that Nazarite vow was something that somebody took on voluntarily for an undefined period of time. But the Bible says that Samson was put under this Nazarite vow, whether he liked it or not, by the Lord. And the Bible says he should be a Nazarite until the day of his death. His whole life, it was intended for him to be a Nazarite. So there was a specific time period given to Samson, and it was not a, a uh, individual free will choice. The Lord told him, commanded him, to live the life as a Nazarite. That's important to remember as you read the story. It'll keep you from getting confused about those matters, okay? So back to Judges 13. I don't think you turned away, but if you did, go back to it. In verse number six, <clears throat> in verse number six through seven, the woman goes and tells her husband of these events. In verse eight, he prays a prayer that is exemplary prayer to all who are expecting or raising children. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Look at verse number 12. And Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? That's a pretty good prayer. Pretty good prayer to pray for when you have children, when you have kids. Lord, what do I do? God, what? How, it's, it's an important responsibility. You've got another person's life in your hands. You've got another person's spiritual life in your hands. The way they're going to be raised is going to influence the way they view the world, the way they view the Bible, the way they view God and often whether or not they get saved. And so you should spend some time on your knees begging God to help you in that, in that matter. Um, 
in the following ver verses, the Lord hearkens unto the prayer of Manoah. He returns to Manoah and his wife. He re reiterates what he originally told the woman, that she should drink no wine nor eat anything unclean, and that they should raise the child as a Nazarite from his birth. In verse 24 to 25, we read about the birth of Samson and the beginning of his ministry. Look at verse number 24. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. All right, so the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. It's important to remember that Samson was a judge. And you're not a judge. You're a New Testament Christian, and the Christian is supposed to be full of the Spirit at all times. Not something that's supposed to be sporadic like it was in the life of Samson. If it's Ephesians 5, verse number 18, that says, Be not drunk with wine, or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, chapter number 14. This is where we're going to spend some time. Some very, 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 very important lessons from the life of Samson in chapter number 14. In this chapter, get out of here. In this chapter, we begin to see the carnality, there's a bug, the carnality and faithlessness of Samson. We begin to see what a carnal man, this man Sam Samson, actually is. Five times, five times in this chapter, someone is said to go down. Someone's said to go down. Look at verse number one. And Samson went down to Timnath. Look at verse number Five, then went Samson down. Look at verse number seven, and he went down. Look at verse number 10. So his father went down. Look at verse number 19. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them. When you start stepping away from the Lord and stepping towards the world, you're not going up. You're going down. Things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. Okay, and as our nation gets farther from God, have you noticed we're not getting smarter? We're getting dumber. We're not getting happier. We're getting more miserable each day that goes by. Look around in the world around you. You see very many happy people. Do you see any joyful people? Do you see any people who have joy like, like God wanted us to have when he created us? It's almost non-existent, even in churches. Why? Because the farther you get from God in your life, and the farther a church gets from God in their ministry, and the farther that our nation gets from God, we're going down. This is one of the reasons you know evolution isn't true. Because we're not getting better. We're getting worse. Look at the world around you. Do you see improvement? Honestly, over the last hundred years, are things getting better or are things getting worse? Things are getting worse. If you could go back 100 years from now, you'd find a better world than we have now. Why? Because the farther people get from God, they're not evolving, they're devolving. We're getting worse. We're getting dumber. We're getting less happy. We're getting less fulfilled. Churches, you as an individual, which way is your spiritual life going? Is it going up or down? Some, some heart searching here. What, how, what's your spiritual life look like? Is it better than it was yesterday or worse than it was yesterday? Is it better than it was a year ago or worse than it was a year ago? How's your, how's your family life? Better or worse? Going up or down? How's your thought life? Used to think about the Lord and now you think about the world. Used to think about spiritual things and now you think about selfish things. Used to think about pure things and now you think about dirty things. Are you going down or are you going up? Something we got to keep an eye on. How, what are your emotions like? Up or down? Uh, if if, if down, you might need to make some changes. You might need to identify some things in your life. Make those changes. Make sure you're in line with the Word of God. Okay, now, I'm going to... Let me read you... Let's see how I want to do this. If we want to read as we go, or if we want to read and then give you these points. Let's read the passage so you know what's going on, and then we will go ahead and, and give you... Uh, some practical application on these verses. Look at verse number one. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. 
Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards at Tim of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. And he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. And after a time he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he told not them that he'd take the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Okay, let's, let's go back to verse number one and start right here in verse number one. The Bible says in verse number one, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath, the daughters of the Philistines, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. In verses 1 and 2, Samson sees a woman, the Bible says, pleased him well. There's only one problem. This woman is not an Israelite. This woman's a Philistine. This woman is not consecrated to living for the Lord. This woman is not dedicated to living for this Lord. This woman is, is not a person that would be beneficial to this young man's Nazarite vow. This is somebody who is in direct disobedience to the word of God. Samson went out and found a wife, and the wife that pleased him well was a woman who was a Philistine and living like the Philistines. Samson was supposed to be separated from the world, separated from these people. He was supposed to deliver the Israelites from these people, and he went and found a wife from those people. Write it down, Exodus 34, verses 15 through 16, and Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 through 3, make it very clear that God's people were not to marry with the inhabitants of the land. So verse number 1, verse number 2 Samson is going in direct violation of the word of God in his desire to marry this Philistine woman because the Bible, God's pure and perfect word, makes it absolutely clear that God did not want his people marrying the children of the land. He didn't want their sons given to their daughters or their daughters giving to their sons. He wanted them separate. He wanted them exterminated and he wanted the Jews to marry the Jews. He wanted Jewish people with Jewish values and the one true God to marry other people with the same values and the same God. We see his parents reply in verse number three. Look at his parents reply. Then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And you know, they bring up a pretty good point. Samson, is there not a pretty girl in all of Israel? Oh, dad, you should have seen her. She's, she's, she's gorgeous. She's so good looking. I mean, I, I need to have her. Son, there's all these Israelite women. They're pretty. They're go No, I need to have her. So good point. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you go and find an Israelite? Why wouldn't you go and seek out a pretty girl from among the Israelites that you were allowed to marry? Here's the reason he wasn't looking in Israel. He was looking in Timnath. Do you know what happens when you go to Timnath to find a wife? You are going to find a Philistine because who hangs out in Timnath? Philistines. Do you know where Israelites hang out? They hang out in Israel. If you go to where the people of the land live and you try to find a spouse from there, guess what you're going to end up with? A worldly spouse. You know what's going to, you know, you know, there are many, there are many young people who are bitter towards their parents and bitter towards God because they aren't allowed to marry a heathen because well, I, I just gotta, I can't find any, there's no good Christian boys, there's no good Christian girls in my church, I'm never gonna get married because I have to marry a Christian. 
And their objection is that there's just no girls that believe like us. There's no boys that believe like that. I know one and he's ugly. I know one or two and they're both, they're both ugly. But you know what their problem is? They're not looking in Israel. They're looking in Timnath. Their problem is they're, they're not seeking for a spouse from among the daughters of my people. They're seeking for a spouse out in the world. You're not going to find an Israelite in Timnath. You're going to find a Philistine in Timnath. You know, this happens all, and we're going real practical with this, okay? We're going real practical with this, but you, you need to marry somebody who believes like you. That's the Bible. Be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. You, and I would go even farther than that. That's the biblical commandment. Make sure they're saved. But I would go even farther than that and say, they really ought to be the kind of saved you are. They ought to not be a world. Well, she's going to heaven when she dies, so that means I can marry her. You're setting yourself up for some problems, man. You're setting yourself up some real, real issues, and you're not going to live for the Lord because you're married to someone like that. That's what's going to happen. You think she's going to come up to you? You think he's going to come up to you? It ain't going to happen. You're going down to their level. And you're not going to find, you're not going to find, okay, you're not going to find a good Christian girl out in the world. Look, this is what you have. This is what you have in our churches all over the place. You have an 18-year-old boy, okay? For example, 18-year-old boy. He has a driver's license. He, has a dri- he can drive anywhere in the world. He can go anywhere he wants. He's 18. He's an adult. He's too lazy to move to a good church. Or he's too unable to move to a good church. He's too lazy to drive to a young adult conference. He's too lazy to visit other churches, and then he'll complain because there's just no good Christian girls anywhere. I just can't find them. And then he'll drive in that same car to work and drive in that same car to school and find some girl there and say, well, I just got to settle for this because there's no good Christian girls out there. You're looking in Timnath, man. Of course you found a Philistine. Of course you can't find a Christian. You're not looking in churches. You know, there's Christian, it, 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 stupid. There's a million Christian girls saying there's just no Christian boys out there. And there's a million Christian boys saying there's just no Christian girls out there. Duh! <laughs> it's because to you it's acceptable to spe- seek, a, seek a spouse among the Philistines. But you don't stop and think, why don't I seek a, seek a spouse amongst people that believe like me? You're just like Samson. Here's the other thing you have. Young people go to these meetings with these other churches or within their own youth group, there'll be 10 good Christian girls and one Philistine. You ever notice that? Some, some, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be five guys that are great Christian guys, and there'll be one or two that are, that are just Philistines living in Israel. And it just seems that I, I always want to go for the Philistine. Don't do that. I just couldn't find a good Christian girl. You passed up five of them to get to that Philistine. You know who else is at fault? Parents are at fault in this matter. You send your children, none of you are parents, okay, so maybe, maybe, one of you, maybe one of you are parents. You send your children to Timnath, eight hours a day, six days a week. You're too sorry to ever take the time to take them to a Bible conference, take them to a missions conference, take them to a young adults conference, take them to a youth rally, take them to a vacation, just visiting all the wonderful churches throughout the United States and meeting people and finding people. You know what you're doing? And you, you whine and complain. You, why, why, just, why, why are you taking an interest in her? Why don't you find a Christian girl? Because you don't take them anywhere. Because you just want to sit around and do nothing instead of take them to conferences and meetings and be busy for the Lord. You go out and you expose your child to Timnath and then complain when they marry a Philistine. You're not going to find an Israelite. You're not going to find an Israelite if where you're looking is among the Philistines. Next thing I want you to notice is Samson's eyes. He's got, a, he's got a real, real problem with his eyes, and this is a very important lesson for us. Look at verse number one. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman. Look at verse number seven. And he went down and talked with the woman. You know what it means? You know what it means? He didn't talk to the woman until verse number seven. That means all the events between verse number one and verse number seven, all those events transpired without him ever speaking to the girl. Do you know what that means? All he did was look at her and say, I want to marry her. Isn't that what he said? Verse number two, verse number three to his parents, get her for me to be my wife. I want to marry that girl. Well, what do you know about her, Samson? 
She's pretty. Well, what's she like? Oh, I don't know. I haven't talked to her yet. Then why do you want to marry her? Because she looks good. You know what Samson's problem was? He was strictly motivated by the lust of his eyes. That means he decided to marry this girl going only by sight. I just can't find a good Christian girl. You mean you can't find a Christian girl that looks like the filth you've been watching on the internet? You can't find a girl that dresses like the harlots out there. I just can't find a Christian girl. You mean you can't find a Christian girl that satisfies the lust of your eyes like you feel like you want the lust of your eyes to be satisfied? I just can't find a good Christian boy. No, you just can't meet a guy that meets the warped fantasy you came up from watching Christian, so-called Christian romance movies. There's a TV show about how she marries this, this good-looking dude, and then he dies. Conveniently, the next season, he dies so she can go have another love affair with another good-looking Christian dude, and you warp your brain on that garbage, and you go out there and say, oh, I can't find a... You know, you mean you can't find a guy that meets the lust of your eyes. Happens all the time. I'm not saying you have to marry somebody ugly. My wife didn't marry somebody who was ugly. <laughs> and I didn't marry anybody ugly. But here's what I am saying. Most people have unwavering standards when it comes to looks, but they're willing to sacrifice in the area of godliness. And I believe your heart and mind should be the other way around. How come we check people off the list at first sight or we put them at the top of the list at first sight without ever getting to verse 7 where we have a conversation with them? I'm just saying, oh, he, he's ugly. He's not the best looking guy, so I'm not interested. Is everything, everything else right? So why, why is that the most important thing? So I'm saying, that was Samson's problem. He looked at this woman and said, I want her, never talk to her, but I want her. And that's why many, many people get into problems. They look at a girl, they look at a guy and say, I need to marry that person because they're so pretty. He's so cute or handsome, or whatever it is that guys are. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I need to have him. I need to have her. And they get all emotionally attached and then find out that they're a Philistine and say, well, it's too late. I still think they're gorgeous. And they get in the mess that Samson gets in. Okay, let's talk about this. Here's, here's the next verse. Uh, this, this is a curious statement that caused me a little bit of confusion at first, but really makes sense when you, when you think about it. <clears throat> verse number three, his parents complain. Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Time out before we move on to the next point. Here's the part where Samson's parents say no. Where is that in the text? Get her for, dad, could you imagine? Dad, yes, do this for me. Okay. Oh no, Samson, you really shouldn't do that. That's a bad idea. Dad, get her for me. Okay, let's go. That's how it went. Do you know how it should have went? Dad, get her for me. Son, that's not a good idea. Dad, get her for me. <laughs> Don't you tell me what to do. I'm your father. No. <laughs> that's how it should have went. He should, oh, if that's what you want, okay. No. That's what he should have said. Okay, and so many people getting so much, make a, make a ruin their life. Sam, Samson literally is about to ruin his life. Because his mommy and daddy loved him too much to say no. Don't raise your kids like that. Don't do it. I could, I could, I could, I, with, a, with a microphone off, I could give you example after example after example of people who just couldn't tell their precious baby no. How about, how about one with the microphone on? David never displeased his son at any time by telling him no. And what ended up happening? A big big mess. A big, big mess. Okay. Anyway, where were we? Not, not on that. Uh, verse number four. But his father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion of the Philistines. For, the same, for at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So a lot of people come to verse number four and say, well, now wait a second. This says it was of the Lord. Doesn't it say that? Verse number four. His parents said, Samson, don't do that. Verse 4 says, but they knew not that it was of the Lord. And so what it 
appears like, a little confusing at first, is that the Lord was somehow for this marriage, but we already showed you two Bible verses that said that God forbade the Israelites from marrying with people of the land. So do you really think that God was in favor of something that was against his word? Do you really think that God was, you know, sent Samson into this, into this Philistines and made him fall in love with this woman to seek an occasion against the Philistines in direct violation of what he already said in the Bible? If that's not what it means, then what does it mean? This is what I believe. I believe that this marriage was of the Lord because of Samson's unwillingness to be used in any other way. Samson refused to be used of the... Th think about it. Think about it. The Lord, the Lord didn't need to cause any of the other judges to marry the enemy so that they could have an occasion against the enemy. Wasn't the fact that the Philistines were oppressing Israel 40 years occasion enough against the Philistines? Look at verse number four. Look at verse number four again. His father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. So the verse is saying that God wanted this marriage to take place because he needed Samson to have a reason to kill the Philistines. And I believe the reason why Samson needed a reason was because he was unwilling to be used for the Lord any other way. Othniel didn't need a reason. He had a reason. They were the enemy. Shamgar didn't need a reason. He had a reason. They were the enemy. Jephthah didn't need a reason. He had a reason. They were the enemy. God didn't make Jephthah go and marry the, the enemy so that he could get mad at the enemy, so he could kill the enemy. This is what's going on in, in this chapter. Sam, look, verse number one. And Samson went down to Timnath. That wasn't the will of the Lord in the first place. So Samson's already outside of the will of the Lord. Samson's already disobeying God. Samson, what's he doing in Timnath? He's palling around with the Philistines. Who are the Philistines? The ones who are oppressing Israel. The ones he was supposed to be trying to kill. What's he doing? He's making friends with the enemy. And I just picture, I picture God in heaven looking down going, what is wrong with you? You're supposed to be killing these people. And there you are making friends with them. There you are hanging out with the enemy. What, what am I going to do with you? I know what I'm going to do with you. You want the enemy? I'll give you the enemy. Okay? You, you want that Philistine girl? Okay, I'll make you fall in love with that Philistine girl. And you're going to wa watch it wreck your life. And we're going to watch it wreck your life so bad that finally you'll realize that they're the enemy and not the friend. And finally you'll get mad enough at the Philistines to do what I was telling you to do from the very beginning. You see what I'm saying? Samson was unwilling to just be used of the Lord because the Lord said so. So the Lord said, well, because you won't be used by me, I'm going to have to set up this situation to make you mad enough at the Philistines to do what I wanted you to do in the first place. This wasn't plan A, okay? This was, this was messed up. This was, look, th this, this was not how it was supposed to be. Don't look at this and say, you know, this is how it, it ought to have been. This is Book of Judges. <laughs> this, is, this is Samson making a mess. This is a carnal man, and God is going to use him, but God has to work with this mess in order to use him. And so the, the simple lesson for us is don't put the Lord in this kind of situation in your life. The ideal situation would have been for Samson to just obey the Lord and beat the Philistines. But he wanted to be friends with the enemy, so the Lord let the enemy show him that they were not friendly. Hear somebody say, you know, alcohol ruined my entire life, and now I go give my testimony at churches about how terrible alcohol is, and drugs ruined my life, and now I go around and speak at conferences and tell people how terrible drugs are. Sin, me got, sin got me into so much trouble, and now let me give you my testimony and tell you how I hit rock bottom before I realized how terrible sin was. Those are people who had to marry a Philistine before they realized that Philistines were the enemy like God said they were. Wouldn't it be better if all those people would have... Uh, praise God for the testimony of the drunk, druggy, uh, whoremonger who's all the way out in the world, and he hits, he's, he's married to the world, and he hits rock bottom and realizes how terrible the world's been to him. And so he 
trusts God, gets saved, and now he's right and living for the Lord. But what a better testimony it would have been if it would have got saved young and said, yeah, I believe God that that's the enemy and never go out there. That's, that's the situation of Samson. He didn't want to live for the Lord. He wanted to mess around with the enemy. So God said, okay, well, then I'm going to let you hit rock bottom so you can realize uh, how terrible this enemy actually is. And that'll, that'll come to pass as we go to the later in the chapter. You'll understand what we're saying a little bit more. Basically, what ends up happening is, is Samson marries this woman, and her people and her father does Samson really wrong, does him really, really bad, to the point where they actually give her to another man. And that provokes Samson to anger, and then he goes out and whoops the Philistines because he's mad at them for taking his wife, which is what he should have been doing in the very first place. Okay. Um, in verses 5 through 9, we read the famous story. Oh, man, it's late. We read the famous story of the lion and the honey. Now, in verse 5, we have another indication that Samson was less than completely devoted to his Nazarite vow. Look at verse number 5. Then went Samson down and his father and mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. Behold, a young lion roared against him. Anybody remember what the rules for a Nazarite was? Was it to come by a dead body? Was not to shave his head? And was not to eat or drink of anything that came from a grape or from a vine? Why are you in a vineyard, Samson? You're not supposed to eat grapes. Why are you getting so close to something that's forbidden? For you. He wasn't taking this thing seriously. He wasn't supposed to eat grapes, touch grapes, drink grapes in any form. Fermented, unfermented, raisins, anything to do with a grape. Grape soda, couldn't do it. Related to a grape, don't touch it, don't eat it. And here he is strolling in a vineyard. At the very least, it was a bad idea to be so close to something that was forbidden. When he came to this vineyard, the Bible says a young lion roared against him. Anybody, anybody remember anything else in, in all of Scripture about a young, uh, roaring lion? 1 Peter 5.8 says what? That the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about like a roaring lion, seek, seeking whom he may devour. Here's the application. When you start messing around with something you shouldn't be messing around with, you are vulnerable for a lion attack. Samson was safe. He was okay until what? Until he went to that vineyard. And still he started messing around, getting just a little bit too... Well, I wasn't drinking the grapes. I wasn't eating the grapes. I was just getting maybe a little bit closer to I sh that I should have been to the grapes. And when he does that, a lion roars upon him. You know, this world is full of vineyards. This world is full of vineyards. What do I mean by that? You ever, you ever see a vineyard, a real vineyard? You ever you go to Dobson, you go to Elkin, go out, they got those vineyards, you know, real, real fancy place. You know what a vineyard is? It's a place you can walk through and look around and smell without ever eating a grape. You could, you could go on a tour of one of those vineyards and you can look at the grapes and look at how they grow the grapes and look at how they pick the grapes and look at how they juice the grapes and ferment the grapes and make the wine. You know, we don't have to drink that wine. You could, you could go to a vineyard and leave without ever touching anything that was wrong, without ever even touching a single grape. But you need to be careful because if you get, you get walking around a vineyard when you shouldn't be touching grapes, oh, I'm not touching grapes, I'm not. Lord, you didn't see me. You did not see me put, pop one single grape in my mouth. Why are you in the vineyard in the first place? When you start going down to a vineyard, what are you doing? Making yourself available or vulnerable, opening yourself up to an attack by the roaring lion. We need to be very, very careful. Guys, we need to be careful in our life. There are a lot of things we can do and places we can go that are technically not sin, but they really put us in danger of a lion attack. There's a lot of vineyards that you walk past every single day. Was Samson commanded against going to a vineyard? No, but he shouldn't have been eating grapes. What's growing in the vineyard? Grapes. When he went down there, a lion attacked him. Your social media, 
You know what that is? That's a vineyard. Is it wrong? Maybe a little. <laughs> Not in and of itself. But you're definitely opening yourself up to a lion attack. How about YouTube? Anything wrong with YouTube in and of itself? <laughs> Maybe a little. <laughs> in and of itself, nothing's wrong with YouTube. But would you not admit that's a vineyard full of lions? You don't have to. You don't have to raise your hand because I would never want to embarrass you or or anything like that. But let's just make this a statement of fact. We have all accidentally seen something on a computer that maybe we didn't linger upon, maybe we didn't stare at, but we kind of wish we hadn't seen it. You know what that was? You were in a vineyard and a lion attacked you. And we look at it as, well, I mean, no big deal. It is a big deal. You were attacked by a lion. And yeah, maybe you rent him like Samson did, but what if you didn't? What if next time the lion rends you? You know what that is? Vineyard. Be careful. Oh, texting. Okay, useful tool to stay in communication with people, also a tool to backbite and devour and break up relationships and cause problems and cause heartache. You know, you say things in a text you'd never say to people in voice. You get you get you get you a little boyfriend or a little girlfriend and you say, You are so pretty. You are so hot. You are, I think I love you. You'd never say that in person. If you were face to face with that same little girlfriend or little boyfriend, you'd never say those same things that are emotionally tying you and honestly are, are drawing upon your lusts and fleshly desires. You'd never say that with your mouth face to face, but you'll say it on a text. What is it? It's a vineyard. Vain imaginations, thoughts, or emotions. Vineyards, gossip, bitterness, ungodly friendships. How about too much work? Nothing wrong with working. Nothing wrong with working a lot. Nothing wrong necessarily with working too much, but at some point, that could be a vineyard. How about too much play? Too much rest? Too much entertainment? There's, there's nothing wrong with taking a nap, but is it a vineyard? Certainly could be. Nothing wrong with taking a day off. Nothing wrong with taking a little break. Nothing wrong with going out with the family, spending some time with the family. You're right, nothing wrong. It's a vineyard. Could be a vineyard. Better be careful. I'm just what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is I think we walk into vineyards never realizing they're vineyards. We we in our day to day life we walk right into these things. We, we there's there's signs along the way that say danger lion ahead danger lions in area lion sighting in this area, and we just walk right in there. No 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 care. We, we're, we're so oblivious we don't even know it's a vineyard. Wait wait this is a vineyard. There's grapes. I didn't even notice the grapes. Maybe that's what Samson did. Maybe he didn't even notice it was a vineyard. Yeah, I just thought of that now. Maybe he's walking down the path and all of a sudden he looks up and says, hey, I think these are grapes. Rawr! He's careless. That's us. We're careless. We walk into vineyards every day and never even stop to think, you know, there could be a lion in here. Let's tighten it up, guys. Tighten it up. We got to be very, very careful about those things because if you're not, you might get, you might get killed by a lion. Sure, Samson defeated the lion this time, but what if he hadn't? And honestly, why would you want to fight with a lion in the first place if you didn't have to? Verse number six, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he killed the lion with his bare hands. Okay, that brings us to... Hmm. Hmm. Oh, we can do this. We can do it. I know we're over time, but we started very, very late, so... Quickly, I'll do it quickly. Verse number eight and verse number nine, we read about the honey in the lion. The honey in the lion. What, a, what an interesting story. There's a few different ideas about what this is, what's going on here, the meaning, interpretation of the story. I'm going to give it to you two different ways, and, and you can probably use, use both. They're, they're both, I think, good lessons from this lion's carcass. After a time, verse 8, he returned to take her and turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother. And he gave them and he'd eat. They told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. First way you could look at this, you can look at the lion as the devil. 
and you can look at the honey as temptation. We already established, I mean, lions in the Bible are almost always the devil, save the, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The devil will take something that looks sweet like honey and he'll put it inside of a carcass to try to get you to reach your hand in and eat from filth. You would, you would never, look, you couldn't get a man to reach into a rotting lion carcass for no reason. But if you put something sweet in the middle of that carcass, you, you might be able to convince them. Would, none of us would want to go to a, you think of a rotting animal, gross, right? You think of a rotting lion, even grosser. I mean, that's, I mean a car, carnivorous animal, disgusting. That rotting carcass and everything associated with rot and carcasses. And there's a honeycomb in the middle. Who, who would want to stick their head or their hands into that carcass? Nobody. But you put that honeycomb and all of a sudden this man is reaching his hand where he'd never reach it before because there's something that looks sweet to him on the inside. You know what the devil's going to do? The devil's not going to come to you with a lion carcass and say, hey, would you like a bite of rotting lion? He's not going to do that because you're going to say no. But you know what he will do? He'll say, would you like some honey? Ooh, yes, I love honey. Nothing sweeter than honey. We'll come and get it. It's right in here inside this rotting carcass. You know what the devil's not going to do? Hey, Joey, I got a deal for you. Would you like to ruin your life today? Would you like to throw away all your opportunity? Would you like to cause your spouse and your children to leave you? Do you want to do that? No, because Joey would say, that's a lion carcass. Do you, know what, do you know what the devil will do? Hey, would you like to have a harmless, fun date with that good-looking coworker? Well, that looks more like honey than it does a lion's carcass. But do you know what it ends up as? Destroying your life, running off your wife, running off your children. It's the same lion carcass, but he just puts some honey in the middle to get you to reach somewhere you'd never reach if it weren't for that temptation. So that's, that's one good application of this, this honey in the, in the lion. Here's another way to look at this. And I, I hesitate to make Samson a type of Christ because of his terrible life. But then again, in comparison to Christ, all lives are terrible. And we should remember that, that no type is, is perfect, especially when you're talking about Jesus Christ. So, uh, but but you, you, there, there is some application here to make Samson a type of Jesus Christ. Think about this. Samson and Jesus both slew a roaring lion with nothing in their hands. Both had a strength that was undetectable by the onlooker. Samson had a strength within him that you couldn't, you couldn't tell just by looking at him. You remember the story of Samson and Delilah? Oh, wow, where's your great strength lie, Samson? If, if the dude were, you know, super muscular, <laughs> like the pictures make him look, it wouldn't be a question where his strength li li uh, was lying. Said, so, well, his strength lies in the fact that he's super muscular. I kind of picture Samson as kind of looking kind of average, kind of looking kind of normal, nothing real, maybe, maybe kind of like me, you know? <laughs> oh, wait, we said he probably wasn't muscle-bound. <laughs> where, where did his great strength lie? Okay, so it, his strength was not detectable by onlookers. Same thing with Jesus Christ. He looked like a man. There's no beauty that we should desire him, uh, but he had a power that, that we didn't know of just by looking at him. They were both in pursuit of a bride that was nothing like them. Samson, not in a good way, but Jesus Christ. You know, parents said, Samson, why are you going after a bride like that? And I wonder if anybody ever looked at Jesus and said, what are you going after a bride like that for? That, that bride is, is not worth it. They're not good. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty sorry bride. But I'm sure glad he came after us anyway. So Samson's through this lion. And inside this filthy, rotting carcass was a honeycomb full of bees who were busy making something sweet in the midst of their defiled surroundings. You know what the church is supposed to do? We're supposed to be busy for the Lord making something sweet in the midst of our rotten, defiled surroundings. You can make that honeycomb a, a pretty neat picture of the church and those busy little worker bees as the busy little Christians that are, sure, we're inside of a lion's carcass. Sure, everything around us is rotting and decaying and stinking and gross. But it doesn't matter to us because 
We're not looking at the carcass. We're looking at the bees. And we're not looking at the carcass. We're looking at the honey. And we're not worried about the carcass around us and the rot around us. We're busy, busy, busy uh, making something sweet, enjoying the hive, making honey. Why are we so busy? Not for our own enjoyment, but for his. Look at verse 9. Look, 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 who, gets, look who gets the honey. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. He told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So the bees make the honey, and the one who slew the lion enjoys the honey. And the Christians make something sweet, and their work is not for themselves. It's for the Lord. So interesting, interesting, uh, very possible picture of the Lord Jesus Christ there. Okay, we're done. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the good attention of your people. Lord, pray that uh, this was somehow helpful to somebody. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're dismissed. Go home. Go to bed.